the things that a carpenter does, perhaps nothing is more basic than marking a board. So these four markers are sort of interchangeable, but not really. They have specific application. Lumber crayon will make a big, bold mark that can be seen from a distance, and the color itself can communicate is a symbol for use. Sharpie is indelible. Once it's on, it's always on, and it will mark on any substrate. Since it will mark on anything, if you need to mark, for instance, a metal stud or a piece of uh, valley metal, a piece of flashing, your Sharpie's going to mark it, your pencil's going to skate. Or if you get a little mark with the pencil, by the time you take your eyes off it and you put it back in your bags and then try to find it again on that piece, it's going to be hard to find. Sharpies are awesome. But we get to the real meat and potatoes of marking for a carpenter. Pencils. So there are some advantages to these little guys. Um, it's more conducive to the fine motor skills for little marks. The lead is round, smaller in diameter, easier and quicker to bring to really a fine point, which you've just got to have. You're building cabinets, you're doing fine mill work, you're running case and base, you need a fine point. And this will hold a finer point longer because of the reduced diameter of the lead. Fit behind your ear without giving you a blister, that's great. The downside is if you're doing anything but finish work, you are always going to be breaking your pencil. What good is that? Okay, there's a reason that these are a carpenter's pencil. They're harder to break, they're durable. The lead itself is harder to break because it's, it's bigger in cross section. If you need a mark, this is going to be ready to mark most of the time. Another excellent comment that came uh, on the channel the other day, which I've done occasionally but not often, is you can sharpen both ends of this guy. That way, kind of like a double bitted axe, you can keep a dull point for rough work, a f sharper point for fine work, or you've just always got a pencil in your pocket. Even if you break one end, you just spin it around, you can mark. These are a production versatile great tool. There's a couple other things that a carpenter can do with a carpenter's pencil that perhaps you haven't thought of. They're, they're a shim, aren't they? And they are almost always exactly the right shim that you need for setting a window. We'll do a video one time, sometime on setting windows, but a couple pencils are always about the right distance for the bottom gap on an XO or uh, really any type of window that you may be installing. Here's the one that'll freak you out. Your coworker gets a sliver in his eye. And he lifts his eyelid up and you look in there and sure enough, there's that speck of sawdust or whatever it is. Now what are you going to pull it out with? Now you can roll up a napkin or you can take the end of a match, a paper match works pretty good. But a carpenter's pencil that's used is smooth on all of the edges. There's not a sharp line any place on the edge of that graphite. It's easily manipulated and you can pull a piece of sawdust out of the corner of a guy's eye with the end of your pencil. I've helped people like this, and I've had people take their pencils out and help me. I'm not recommending it. Make sure your malpractice insurance is all paid up. Be careful, but sometimes you're going to be in a jam. Keep it in mind. The end of that pencil, pretty useful. But wait till you've used it a little bit. Don't sharpen it first. So when you sharpen one of these, if you turn your hands around and, and uh, push the knife away from you the way you were taught as a Boy Scout, you're going to have a hard time controlling the sharpening process. I use the controllability of having my thumb against the side of the pencil. I go down part way. This knife is not very sharp. As you get close, you begin to actually expose the lead. I begin to chamfer the corners. And then once the lead's exposed, then I worry about scraping whatever kind of a point that I need, depending on what I'm doing. You can keep that up. You can work that point down. Now I should have long since stopped if I was just framing. Marking a board is basic to building. There's really one way that usually people think of as the way to mark a board. It's a little bit perhaps counterintuitive, but it takes two marks. It happens like this. Let's say you want to make a mark at 40 inches. You put the point of your pencil and mark it. And then you put the point of your pencil back at the mark and mark in another direction. The apex of the two lines is the point of contact. That does a couple of things, but primarily it makes a mark that's big enough to stand up to the pressure of construction. Maybe a dirty board. Now it's time to square it. You can see the near leg disappearing as you get to the mark, so you can keep track of the intersection. You see that? If it was just one mark, you would not be sure where the apex was until you were past it. Perhaps that's overthinking but that's just a good, fast way to make a line. 
the crow's foot has come, in, come to be the standard kind of sine qua non mark for construction for a couple of reasons. One, it's visible from a distance. Two, you can interpret the apex from either side. And three, if I mark and don't quite get it right, the follow-up mark can be used to shift the mark a little to the left or right. You see, I can, I can kind of clean up a mark and move it depending on where I create the new apex. Now, if you're just working by yourself and no one else has to interpret your mark and you're not going to move your feet or change positions, it can be something as simple as just a single mark, 44 inches, bam. Now, I know where that mark is. I'm not going to be confused, but it's not going to mean anything to anyone else. But it'll work. I've seen guys whose habit is rather to make a little, just a little mark like that. Now there's not a thing in the world wrong with that. But a mark like that is not visible from a distance. Okay? It's an up close and personal mark, probably more conducive to finish work than framing. So there's three different ways to mark a board. Not one of them is right, not one of them is wrong. But just make sure you get your mark in the right spot. So you've transferred the measurement to the board. Now you need to put the line that is going to be cut through the measurement. For this conversation, we'll pretend it's a square line. Using a speed square, I vi bring the speed square over to where it visually intersects the apex of the mark, and I mark it. Now depending on the accuracy you need, you make a finer or a heavier line. You are trying to center your line on your mark. The allowable tolerance of the piece you're cutting is going to insist on either a finer or a heavier line because you are going to be bisecting that line with one edge or the other of the saw depending on which side of the board is the side you're keeping. So it's a question, isn't it, about whether you leave the line or take the line, how much of the line you take, how much of the line you leave. That question is really only a question when you're communicating between two guys. One guy's taking the measurement, one guy's marking the board, one or the other of them is making the cut. There's sort of a standard additional call out when somebody's getting ready to cut a line where you've taken the measurement, and that is leave the line or take the line. So that indicates that additional degree of accuracy that is described by the thickness of the pencil line. But when you're doing the measuring and you're doing the marking, you're going to know where on that center of that pencil line your actual net measurement is, and that will dictate where the saw blade runs. Can you see that the entire kerf was subtracted from the length of the piece on the left? Can you see that half the kerf was subtracted from the piece on the left? And can you see that no cur nothing at all was subtracted from the piece on the left? Now the guy who took the measurement and made the mark is going to understand which of those approaches is going to be right to get the length and the piece of lumber that you need. So in the simple task of measuring and marking and cutting a board, there are at least four specific ways to screw it up. And besides that, each of those sort of incremental parts of the process has their own opportunity for a, a variation or a, a margin of error that can accumulate. So when you actually get the piece to put it in, you have no idea how you got so far off. First, the measurement can be incorrect, particularly on an inside measurement. Second, you can put the mark in the wrong spot, either by mentally dropping an inch, adding an inch, or just inattention and placing the mark. It's easy to do, guys. Third, you can make the mark wrong. Your square's not in contact, or you let the angle of the square of the pencil relative to the work vary as you mark. Um, you, you just set the wrong um, degree on your protractor. Any of those things can happen. you so that the scribed mark is in the wrong spot, and then the cut. Remembering, and control, remembering where the net distance is and controlling your saw. So you've got at least these four uh, opportunities to screw up the length, the fit of a board, and really each one will have its own little contribution to either a nice fit or something that you need to throw away and start again. The most technically accurate line that you can make, maybe you're doing finish work, maybe you're building a piece of furniture. I have here a piece of vertical grain white oak been stained, it's been sealed. Got here a piece of clear vertical grain fur. I'm not just going to pull out my big pencil or and I'm not going to hack this with a skill saw. You can put your scribe on there and take your utility knife.
That's a fine line. That's the kind of tolerance you need when you're really working down to a tight, tight specification. A razor knife, a box knife, a nice sharp edge is going to give you a, a line that's accurate. Let me make up a number and say within two or three thousandths. Sometimes that's a tolerance you have to work to as a carpenter. So with expensive material in an interior finish condition when a fine line is important, you can use a mechanical pencil. The lead's not going to break on a surface like this. A lot of guys that I've watched do this work, I've used it a time or two myself, use an X-Acto knife. You can always get a sharp edge. It's angled out there. This utility knife's been beat up with roofing and everything else. But for a tight, tight tolerance line in a very exact spot that's going to relieve the grain a little so it has no tendency to splinter as the cut is made, use a razor. It's a perfect line. So here's my parting shot. Not every measurement, not every mark, not every cut is critical to the success of the job. But there are times in every job, usually around layout time, that accuracy is super important. So when you come to those junctures, learn to recognize them. And when your measurement and your mark is going to cost somebody a lot of money when it's wrong, stop the side conversations, turn the radio down or off, kind of get into the zone, double check your work, and make sure that that measurement, that mark, that cut is exactly right or there's going to be a lot of people for a lot of time that are going to regret your inattention. Mm -hmm.